Hi, this is Justin Cloudy of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the podcast. And this week, we're going to be doing something we haven't done in a while, a Q&A episode. This was pretty popular the last time we did. Hopefully, you guys will dig it again. We have a bunch of great questions to dive into, some about Michael Brower's setup. Uh, we had Michael Brower on the podcast a couple weeks back, probably one of our most popular episodes so far. People really love hearing from this guy. But there were questions about some of the specifics to his multibus setup that we could have gone into even more detail on in the podcast. So based on my conversations with Michael, both recorded and not recorded, and the latest Tape Op magazine, which if you don't have, I will go through some of the extra details and exactly how Michael Brower is setting up his multi-bus approach to compression today. In addition to that, we had some questions and comments around the bit depth and sampling rate episodes. Really good feedback there that I want to clue you guys into, as well as some questions about landing audio jobs. Not only just landing your first audio job, but getting into an even better one kind of moving forward in your career. So we'll look at those questions as well as some about listening levels while mixing or mastering. A lot of fun stuff to take apart in today's podcast. Before we get into it, here it is, your 90 seconds or so of pure bliss as I shout out our sponsors for this week's podcast. Number one, I am wearing their t-shirt, Isotope. If you haven't checked out Isotope, you've at least probably heard me talking about them on this podcast because I use Isotope's RX, their noise removal suite, all the time. It does fantastic stuff I couldn't do otherwise. Their ozone suite for mastering, I use in every single mastering chain I do. Even when I'm in a big analog system, I'm at least using some component from Isotope's ozone. But that's really not all the stuff they make. Isotope's trash is a sleeper one that I think is amazing if you're looking for a comprehensive toolkit for saturation and distortion. Isotope's nectar, a whole suite for vocal processing, and neutron is really interesting. If you don't know what neutron does, it has this thing called track assistant on it, where you can put Neutron on like every one of the tracks in your session, and each track will listen to every other track, and it can actually make suggestions for what EQs to cut or boost so that you can avoid masking problems. So like your snare drum track can be listening to your guitar track and making suggestions, hey, if you cut here, you might get rid of the masking from the guitars. I mean, this is really next-gen interesting stuff, and everything they make, it's never like a faithful recreation of an original piece of hardware with all the controls. No, they're like, we're making plugins for computers. We're going to do things that only computers can do. And they really take advantage of the digital domain in a way that some plugin companies don't. Speaking of great plugin companies, another sponsor for this podcast is Sound Toys. These guys really walk that fine line where they are doing things that are kind of inspired by and recreations of traditional stuff. But then they put so many extra functions and tools inside of them. Things like the Decapitator. I mean, that's really fun for saturation. The Devilock Deluxe, really kind of classic, fun, mangled distortion sounds. Echo Boy, it's like the Swiss army knife of delays. They have that kind of ease of use and simplicity of hardware, but with all the other bells and whistles you can only get out of a plugin. Last, certainly not least, sponsoring again, another plugin company, Eventide. Eventide actually doesn't make just plugins. They still make killer hardware effects, both stomp boxes and rack effects. Not only do they make really interesting next-gen forward-looking stuff today, like mangled verb, or their structural effects like fission, where you can affect the transient and sustain of a signal separately. They also do great plug-in reissues of their older iconic effects from 30 years ago or more, like the Instant Flanger, the Instant Phaser, the H3000, really memorable tools, in addition to the new stuff like Black Hole and Mangled Verb and all this fun stuff. Wow, those are probably three of my favorite slash the best plug-in companies on the planet, and they're all sponsoring this podcast. Do you know what that means? That means this must be a pretty damn cool podcast. Thank you guys for listening to it. So the very last sponsor I'm going to mention on this is you guys. If you want to be a supporter of this podcast, I welcome you to do so. Check us out at sonicscoop.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash sonicscoop where you can become a supporter and you can earn back the price of your support membership really, really fast by getting some major discounts on courses of ours like Mixing Breakthroughs, Mastering Demystified, or Mixing Drums. So definitely check us out there. There's access to all sorts of fun stuff like behind the scenes, live members-only Q&As with me and some of our very special guests. All right, without further ado, let's get right into it, into question number one. All right, 
Question number one here is a gear question, and this comes from Torpedo Boy on YouTube. Torpedo Boy writes, what are your headphones? They look dope. All right, so which headphones are you talking about, Torpedo Boy? Are you talking about these headphones or perhaps these headphones? Maybe you're talking about these headphones or is it these headphones or maybe you're talking about these headphones or maybe some of my favorites here these headphones. Oh man, that's a lot of headphones. You know what? At some point, I am going to do a roundup of some of the best headphones out there for mixing and mastering applications and for tracking applications. And I've got a lot of good ones to choose from. That's just a small handful of them. I didn't want a huge pile on my desk here. So I only brought out these. But uh, the particular headphones you're probably asking about are these. I've been wearing them a lot on the podcast. These are made by a company called Olo. And no, they're not paying me to say this. I'm just mentioning it because these are the headphones I was wearing. They're kind of cool looking. A lot of people think they're the Grados. Uh, they are not the Grados, but they're similar in design in the sense that they have this kind of wood going around the edges of them. So they are some very handsome and super comfortable headphones. So that's one of the reasons I've been wearing them on the podcast a lot. They also make an open back version of these uh, that sound, in my opinion, even better. But I don't really wear these in the podcast because then the person who I'm interviewing, their voice comes through these headphones and then I have to edit it out because that's how open back headphones work. But uh, Olo, they make good stuff. Uh, these are fairly high-end headphones. Uh, they're Again, they're super comfortable, super good looking. They're a brand from Europe, O-L-L-O, -L -L -O, and that's one of the reasons I've been uh, rocking them just because they look good and are comfy on the podcast. But they also sound good. They are very, I would say, clear and articulate sounding headphones. And if you're looking for something that is very clean and clear and articulate, comfortable, good looking, that is one option. They have a similar, you know, wood grained, handsome look to say the Grado headphones that some people are more familiar with. So that's a, a brand to potentially check out. Again, that is not a sponsor plug, just a fact about what headphones I've often been using on this podcast and why. And there's a lot of great headphones out there. There's some other headphones I use even more often for critical listening uh, applications that just suit my tastes a little bit more, that are a little on the darker, smoother side. But for those people who like a lot of clarity and articulation, I think they're fantastic. And they're way better than uh, a lot of headphones you're going to find uh, at a cheaper price. Well, let's get into some even meatier questions here. We did an episode about a week ago uh, that was all about audio jobs, where they are, how much they pay. And Nicholas Smith writes on the article version of this, great article, Justin. Do you know where the best location is to seek out salary jobs in Atlanta? I'm working independently, but would love to do something in the salaried sector. Well, unfortunately, I don't know the Atlanta market that intimately. Uh, there's definitely film going on in Atlanta, you know, audio post-production going on in Atlanta. There's also definitely music studios in Atlanta. We actually interviewed recently a great engineer and producer, Ben H. Allen, who's been working down in Atlanta, I think, for more than a decade now. And there's been a lot of hip-hop studios in Atlanta. I think Neil Pogue, another great mixer, was based on there. But of course, a lot of this uh, studio work, you know, mixing, recording in the music world, that stuff is not going to tend to be salaried. If you're looking for salaried work, well, like we said in that episode about studios and jobs, man, it's 10 to 1 against you where there's 10 times as many freelancers working as there are salaried people. And I think one of the reasons Nicholas asked about Atlanta is because it came up as one of those regions, one of those cities where audio jobs are on the rise. The number of audio jobs was dropping just slightly in New York City and a little bit more significantly in California in the past year's data. But in Atlanta, audio jobs were up like 30%. In, uh, I think in the city of Atlanta specifically, it was like 37%. And in the state of Georgia, it was 30%. Texas, Florida, those were some others that had 30% and 40% increases in the number of jobs. But even in those markets, again, Salary jobs are a much smaller portion of the market than our freelance jobs. And if you're looking for a salary job, there are a few kind of rules of thumb that I can give you. Number one, just like the freelance assistants and the freelance engineers at a given studio might have once been, you know, the unpaid interns or the freelance assistants at that studio kind of moving up the ranks, that is often similar to the transition into paid work 
where you are on salary, where a lot of salaried people were former freelancers at the same institution where they eventually became salaried. So that's one thing to consider. But another thing to consider is that that's not always the case. Sometimes people are hired from completely outside of an organization. But in either case, usually when you're meeting a salaried person in audio, there's a couple of things that are in common about their job. There's usually two categories these salary jobs fall into. One is that they're more managerial in nature. Or two, they're doing a lot of repetitive tasks. The same thing again and again and again and again. The same type of work again and again. So on that first tip, the more managerial work, at a lot of studios, whether it's a post-production house or a, a music recording studio, a lot of the times the engineers will be freelancers. But if they have a studio manager, that studio manager might be on staff and might be a salaried person. So that's something to think about, that often those roles that are going to be a bit more salaried are going to be a bit more managerial. It's even true with an education. I've worked in uh, education in you know higher learning in the audio sector, both for universities and for some vocational schools. When I was hired in as the chair for what was then, and it's probably still now, the largest vocational audio school in New York City, I was hired in as a salaried person, but I was overseeing 22, 23 teachers that were working for me, and each one of them was in more of like a freelance kind of hourly role. It's actually quite uncommon, especially in the biggest markets, to really find a lot of salary jobs, even for people who are teaching audio, not just working in it. And the same experience in New York, working as a professor in colleges and universities. Uh, the universities, there would be a very small staff of you know, the core professors who were on salary, and a whole world of adjunct professors basically working for them and teaching the majority of the classes. And to a degree, those professors would teach some classes, but have some degree of a managerial role where they're doing a bit more overseeing the teacher, uh, the adjunct teachers, overseeing the curriculum, working a little bit more one-on-one -on -one in an advisory role with students. So whether it's in education or whether it's in industry, often you're finding the people who are in salary jobs a little bit more administrative. The other types of places you might look for salaried work are, again, where they need someone on staff to do the same stuff again and again, or to be on call at a moment's notice. So in the education sector, one thing that you do find people who are salaried will be like the chief technician at a recording school or a music school. There might be a chief technician for that school that might be a salaried person. And then finally, those people who are doing repetitive tasks, a lot of the same stuff again and again. This could be in audiobooks. It could be in audio post-production. It's less and less in music these days, but sometimes you will find a staff engineer in those kinds of positions. It could be for a TV show. I know an engineer who works for Spotify on salary there, who's constantly recording bands you know, live in the studio for Spotify. I know another engineer who's on salary for one of these big TV shows that shot in New York City where they're constantly having on musical performers. And I know other people who have been on salary doing kind of audiobook editing or audiobook recording or that kind of thing at a house that deals mostly with post-production. So again, I can't tell you how to get a job specifically in any given market other than do what I did when I wanted to get my first job that wasn't working for me, which was I sent out 100 resumes and uh, had one paying offer and 10 non-paying offers. So <laughs> that, that's one thing you can do to get a job. And the second time I got a job that wasn't just working for me and finding clients was I got recu recruited into that uh, you know big chair of the department uh, at an audio school job. I was recruited. I, at that point, was re writing a blog post every single day. I had a decent presence out there. I had done some videos and I was recruited by their team. They said, you're the kind of person we'd want in this job. Will you take it? And I said, yes. So those are the two last tips I can give on getting jobs. One, you send out a hundred resumes, try to make them as personalized as possible. And two, try to be doing interesting things and develop a reel and try to be so busy and so good that they can't ignore you. And then the offers start coming in.
Well, I talked a little bit longer about that than I expected to, but I hope some of that uh, was useful. Now let's get into some of the audio stuff. So we had a big question came from a few people about Michael Brower's setup. And Michael Brower talked so much about the art and the creativity of mixing in his interview with us, but he didn't talk in tremendous detail about how he's actually doing his multibus summing setup. And in part, that was because he had recently done an interview with Tape Op magazine. And shortly thereafter, they were going to be coming out with an article that was really all about, or at least mostly about, how his multibus setup looks today. Well, I happen to have that issue of Tape Op right here behind me. And if you guys are not yet subscribers to Tape Op, you should be. I mean, this is a free magazine. You can go to tapeop.com and go sign up to get this thing for free. Tape Op, I've been reading it since, my goodness, I don't know, the year 2000, 2001, something like that. So a long, long time. I have a whole stack of these at home. But this is the latest one with Michael Brower. I would say these guys are the other best audio publication right after Sonic Scoop. So they're probably like the second best audio and studio publication in the world. I mean, Sonic Scoop is obviously the best one. But after that, you've got Tape Op and uh, potentially, I'd say, Sound on Sound. I'm also quite found, fond of Sound on Sound. Those are the two other things other than Sonic Scoop you should consider reading. Um, I don't know if there's any other things you should consider reading beyond that. Oh, the Pro Audio Files. They're great, too. Uh, they're another website. It, actually, in Sonic Scoop's content network. But here you go. Tape Op Magazine, Michael Brower. And if you don't have the time, interest, or inclination to read it, I will go through some of the key points that are in here, as well as some of the key points that Michael Brower raised to me when we talked about what his setup is looking like today. So I'm going to see if I can actually do a quick screen recording for you guys who are watching the video version of this. And for you guys who are on the audio-only version of this podcast, well, I'll just make sure to explain it pretty well. It can seem pretty complex and intimidating at first, how Brower is doing his multi-bus system, but I think I can break it down in a way that's going to be really clear and that you can extract some principles from that maybe you can bring into your own workflow. Okay, so let me bring this up here. This article is titled Michael Brower, The Emotion of a Mix that you can find in the latest tape op, issue number 131. I'm not going to read the whole article out loud for you guys, but I will scroll down and for those of you who are watching on video, give you a view of a nice chart that they have in here. And again, I can't recommend enough that you check out this article for yourself if you want even more depth. But they have a chart here called the Brower Sound Flow Chart. And let's take a closer look at it. I'm going to zoom in on it. And here we go, the Brower Sound Flow Chart. So Michael Brower, his setup is a little different from a lot of other people because he came, comes from the analog world originally. He's now working on an all-digital console, but his approach to this multi-bus setup has been really influential. And I would say that a lot of audio engineers working in the digital domain do something a little like Brower, but there are some differences here. Kevin Killen was one of the first guys I heard talking about this approach in the in-the-box mixing domain years ago. He said that when he moved from analog to digital, he had trouble making in-the-box mixes work at first. But then he kind of figured it out. And for him, creating multiple buses was a big part of getting the structure and the sound of his mix together fast. And I think what a lot of people do is, is a bit similar to maybe what he has recommended, which is to kind of group your instruments together by, you know, instrument groups. So all of your drums are going through one bus. And then you maybe have a bus for all your guitars, a bus for all your keyboards, a bus for all of your background vocals. And a lot of people are doing something in their in-the-box mixing templates these days, a little bit like that, where they will have basically subgroups for each of their instrument categories. And then they may be doing a significant amount of processing, compression, and maybe even EQ on those subgroups instead of on individual tracks. And actually a lot of major mixers work in a way like this. Not all of them, but a really significant proportion of them. But Michael Brower's approach, that's a little bit different. And in a way it evolved out of just the limitations he had on his consoles where in the beginning he only had a few buses to work with. He didn't have all of the buses that you have available today. But also may work well for him and for others because he's not categorizing things just by instrument group, but by their function in the mix. So the fact that he was handed some limitations of creating a multi-bus approach on an analog system made him think about, okay, if I'm going to have a minimal number of groups, how should I really be categorizing them? And what he came up with, again, is by function in the mix, he's categorized them. 
So he has four different main buses, an A, B, C, and D bus. And that A bus has what he would call, say, the top end of the record. So here in this chart, it's labeled as maybe being a bus where you'd have keys, pianos, synths, strings, all the kind of accompaniment instruments that are part of the meat of the record, but aren't maybe the central focus. Those things would go to a bus together. And then he'd have a separate bus, bus B, that would be like his bass bus. And bass meaning the foundation of the record. So drums and bass would go through this bus together. And then he'd have a C bus, which he'd think of as being the center to the record. And that would be a bus where maybe something like guitars would go through much of the time. Now, the exact instruments that go to each of these buses could vary depending on the mix, the way Michael Brower has explained it to me. But then he would have a fourth bus, bus D, and that bus D, he would use a special compressor. In his case, it was something called Edward the Compressor that he still uses to this day. And the special feature about this D bus is basically that compressor had built in a stereo widening effect. You could recreate this on your own system with other things, obviously, but he has this D bus that was just anything that wanted to be widened out of it. In this particular flow chart, it's showing background vocals flowing to both his A bus as well as his D bus. So the background vocals might be treated as something that would be grouped together with keys, pianos, and strings, and all those accompaniment things, but they might also, in addition, go through the D bus so that get some of that spreading effect as well. It looks like over time, his setup got even more complex where he ended up with a parallel bus. And here in this flow chart, it shows an 1176 compressor where maybe he's really crushing things through there. So he has a parallel compressed mix that he can send other things to. And then there's a separate bus for lead vocals. And the lead vocals, he credited learning this from a, another great producer engineer named David Kahn. David Kahn being someone who's worked with Paul McCartney, Sublime, The Strokes, Sugar Ray, The Bangles, Romeo Void, a whole bunch of great artists. And he said one of the things that he learned from David Kahn was sending lead vocals to a variety of compressors. He talks about that a little bit in this interview here. He said, eventually my vocals became separate from the A, B, C, and D buses. I'd send it to four different sounding compressors, a Fairchild 666, one of my gate stay levels, an 1176, and a distressor. Each one sounded different. One was more of a head sound. One was throaty. One was urgent. And then I'd have the distressor on crush and sneak a little bit of that back in. So to recap, you've got these four buses, one that is more for those accompaniment elements, one that is for drums and bass, one is for what he thought would be the center of the record, bus C, guitars, and then a fourth bus that had a compressor with a widening effect on it. And in addition to that, there might be a parallel mix that he could send everything to for some extra crush, as well as a whole separate chain for his vocals where he might have several different compressors and then recreating a new sound for the vocal by kind of balancing between these different compressors. The way he explains it here, it seems to me like he is using these vocal compressors in parallel. Also, based on his explanation here, it sounds like he has a parallel uncompressed full mix so he can fold back in some of the raw, naked, uncompressed transients back into the main mix. Now, that's not the only thing people want to know. People also want to know, of course, what specifically, specifically what gear he is using and whether or not the summing here is digital or analog. A guy named Blue Matrix on YouTube asks, so how is Michael Brower summing now? It seems that the multibus system is not yet happening in the box, even though he's on a digital console and mixing significantly in the box with a digital console, really a digital controller, an Avid S6, acting as a huge, giant, beautiful mouse for Pro Tools in a sense. So there are answers here, and it looks like yeah, Michael Brower appears to be doing analog summing. I personally am a little bit of a skeptic of analog summing. I think that analog summers definitely have a tone, but I think that comes from the analog componentry in them having a tone more so than the summing having a tone. I think the summing aspect may be a little bit more of a red herring, but no question that some of these summing boxes can sound a little bit different from each other. And they there can be subtle nuances in the tone. And he appears to be using three or four of them in his setup. We'll go through that in some detail in just a second. And then he also lists the tools he's going through. 
So here we go. Through his A bus, where he might be sending keys, pianos, synths, strings, etc., all of those things are going through a Neve 8816 summing bus and then into a Neve 33609 stereo compressor and then to some Pultec EQs. So really fat, smooth, rich, classic stuff. That's the general words I'd attach to those tonalities for the A bus. Then this B bus that has drums and bass would be going out through a converter and into a Chandler mixer, as it appears to be a summing bus, and then into a pair of distressors, and then an Avalon EQ, an E55. Then the guitars would also be coming out of a digital audio converter and into a Tonelux OTB16, which is another one of these summing boxes, and then into a Pendulum ES8, which is a tube compressor, and that's uh, where his guitar bus would be going. Then lastly, you've got this Edward the Compressor, where he's sending the sounds that want to be more widened. This seems to be the only major bus that there isn't a summing box on, so he's sending things out to this that go through the Edward the Compressor, interesting compressor that has this widening option. And then that Edward the Compressor actually goes into a Burl B32 mixer. So another kind of analog summing thing is happening here where it meets up with the lead vocals and the parallel compression bus. And then all of those come together into yet another kind of summing box mixer, this Fulcrum, I believe, which is a passive mixer or summing box. And then into a Chandler Red 47, which is a analog preamp line amp that is, I believe, modeled after the kind of EMI Abbey Road console used by, you know, not just the Beatles, but a tremendous number of hits from, you know, 1970s and onwards. And then all of that would finally go into his two mix chain, you know, a kind of master bus chain. In his case, there is a piece of gear here called the Obsidian, which would then go into a Master Bay compressor switcher, and then into here the fun tone boxes, an SSL Fusion, a Curve Bender, a Cush Clarifonic, which is kind of a parallel EQ, and then into this analog limiter, the PL2, which is a uh, very nice, very popular analog limiter from Pendulum, which is uh, popular in a lot of mastering studios. This whole system goes into a analog to digital converter, the Antelope Pure 2, and then it's going in through a crane song head for some kind of tape emulation, and then that is getting printed back into Pro Tools. So, wow, that sounds a little complex, but I think there are key takeaways here for anyone who is mixing music or anything else, and I think we can make this more simple than it sounds. Really, what Brower is doing. I'm going to say it again, is he is combining instruments based on their function in the mix and not just their instrument group. And then he's creating a fairly sophisticated chain for the lead vocal where he can dial between different tones that different compressors give him, which appears to be done in parallel rather than in series. And to hear Michael talk about it, the way that he landed on this approach was because he didn't like the way the compressors were reacting. A main mix bus compressor was reacting when he'd fold all of his instruments in. And probably a lot of you have experienced this. You might set up, say, if you start with bass and drums on the mix and you have them hitting the compressor just the way you want, want it to. And then all of a sudden you start putting in guitars, you start putting in vocals, and now those things are triggering the compressor, and they're not making the drums respond the way that you thought they were responding originally. Uh, in addition, if you're putting things like keys, piano, synth, strings through the same bus as you know your bass and drums through that same main compressor, every time the bass or the drums hit, it could be sucking down those things, or they could be literally sucking down the vocal. Every time you have a significant kick or snare or bass hit, they could be triggering the compressor and making other things suck down on those hits. So separating things out by function makes it not really have that issue where you don't have a lead vocal come in and then all of a sudden it's sucking down your supporting instruments or changing the way the compressors or reacting to the bass and drums. Instead, things that should be hitting a compressor in a similar way go to their own similar compressor. And I think that's a principle that pretty much anyone could take into their own mixing templates, whether they're in the box or elsewhere, whether they can afford to buy four different summing boxes or not. I think that's a principle you could look at in your own work, that there may be times to think about 
compressing things based on their function in the mix and what they do to the compressor, rather than just thinking about instrument groups or just thinking about a main mix compressor. Okay, two more items I want to get to here. The bit depth and sample rate. A few people wrote in to say, ha ha ha, Justin, there's something you forgot. And I did forget to mention. I mentioned a bunch of caveats in that episode, but this caveat I did not. And that is, you know what? If you're going to be slowing stuff down significantly, doing like time expansion and pitch expansion, it can be in those situations absolutely better to work at a high sample rate, even an absurdly high sample rate. So if you're thinking that you're going to be recording stuff, samples or whatever, that you're later maybe going to slow down by as much as 50% or more, you know, then maybe I could see those arguments for, yes, recorded at double or more of the sample rates you normally work at. So that is a great thing that people brought up that I did not bring up. I brought up all sorts of other caveats, including writing sonatas for bats um, and perhaps recording dog whistles. Anyway, moving onwards from sample rate into our next and final question that I wanted to hit today. And this is actually an old question that I think I answered badly, or at least half answer that I could answer better. And this was from Jesse Krakow back in episode five, our first and so far only other Q&A episode, when he asked me about mixing loud and what are the benefits or drawbacks to mixing loud. And because in the most recent episodes we had been talking about level setting and limiting and mastering, I immediately thought when he said mixing loud, he must mean, you know, making a really, really hot mix, compressing things and limiting things a lot. And I gave an answer about, you know, mixing hot, mixing loud, putting out loud mixes. But that may not have been what he was asking about. If he was asking about that, I gave him a great answer. But if he was asking about the level at which you should listen when you're mixing, then I did not answer that question. And I've been kicking myself ever since that episode. What if he meant the volume at which I'm mixing? Is it okay to mix while I'm listening really loud? And that is a good question because a lot of major mixers and mastering engineers have an opinion on it. And I do too. And I would say that a lot of major mix engineers have come to the conclusion that they get their best results when they're spending the majority of their time mixing at relatively quiet levels. Levels where if you were if someone was having a conversation in the room behind you, it would be kind of annoying. You'd have to ask them to uh, lower their voices or take it elsewhere because you're busy mixing and you can't hear the mix over their talking. So that could be something like 50 dB, 60 dB, maybe 70 dB. But it's almost certainly not something like 90 dB or 100 dB. It is not you know, cranking it all the way up and making your mix decisions there. And there's a few reasons for that. One is ear fatigue. You are likely to get totally worn out on mixing so much sooner if you're listening at 90 dB than if you're listening at 70 dB. And I mean dramatically sooner. In fact, I'm going to bring up right now, spur of the moment here, the OSHA tables for sound level exposure. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, something like that. And of course, they are government bureaucracy, so don't take all of their uh, recommendations as gospel. But these are fairly widely accepted. And this is a chart. This is probably pulled from the OSHA data. They say here that at a noise level of 85 dB, your maximum exposure time should be eight hours in any 24-hour period. And then if you're working at just a little bit higher, it would seem, 88 dB, it's actually significantly higher, but numerically it's only a little bit higher, 88 dB cuts that time in half. You should only be exposed to it for about four hours. 91 dB, you should only be exposed to it for two hours. 94 dB, you should only be exposed to it for an hour. 97 dB, you should only be exposed to it for 30 minutes. 100 dB, you should only be exposed to it for 15 minutes. And they're putting out this guide based on you know thresholds for hearing loss. But I would say that a guide like this is probably good for us working in audio because we're not just worried about hearing loss from listening too loud, but ear fatigue, getting worn out, making bad decisions. And I'd say that that could definitely happen after this amount of time and exposure or even sooner than that. And I might recommend being even slightly more conservative than this. 
And a lot of mixing engineers are a lot more conservative than this. A lot of them may be listening somewhere between 60 and 80 dB for a lot of their listening. Now, there's other reasons for this as well. It is not only to protect your hearing, to protect your perspective, but also to help you make better decisions by focusing on the right part of the mix. And that is because of something called the Fletcher-Munson curve. The Fletcher-Munson curve is a way of explaining how our ears perceive things at different levels. And long story short is that when you play back music at a very quiet level, you hear a lot of mid-range where our ears are very sensitive, but a lot less bass and a lot less high end. And as you turn the level up and up and up and up, you start to hear relatively more bass and relatively more treble than you did before. So if you're listening, screaming loud all the time, you get an impression of there being a lot of low end and a lot of top end in your record. But when someone else listens to it later, more quietly or on more of a consumer system, they don't hear all of that. They hear a lot more of that mid-range that maybe you didn't focus on as well as you could have. There's also another issue, and Joe Lambert taught this one to me when I started mastering, which is because the bass sounds different depending on what volume you're listening at, well, if you want to get a really good handle on the bass level, you might want to consider not only listening at a level that's not going to exaggerate it too much, but also listening at a consistent level. So you have a great frame of reference for how the bass on your record is really sitting compared to other records you've worked on or other references that you're listening on. And if you're listening at the same volume all the time, and a lot of major mixers and mastering engineers do this, if you're spending most of your time listening at the same volume level, then you're really going to know when the bass feels right, when the top end feels right, because you're going to be able to feel it physically. You're going to develop a sense memory for, hey, Whenever I'm listening, I usually listen with the volume knob cranked to here, and once I get the record loud enough, it'll be about 80 dB, 81 dB, around there is where Joe uh, told me he likes to listen. I listen slightly louder, uh, in part because I'm slightly less wise and slightly younger, so maybe I'll listen at 82 or 83 dB, but I get a sense memory for, okay, at this volume level, this is how bass should feel. And if I'm feeling a lot more bass than that at this volume level, I'm doing something wrong. If I'm feeling a lot less, I'm doing something wrong. So you're not only listening with just your ears, but almost with your entire body. And that becomes much more possible and you become much more fine-tuned in your ability to do it if you're consistently listening at the same level again and again. Because if you turn things down a little bit, the proportion of bass you expect to hear is going to change. If you turn things up from there, the proportion of bass you're going to expect to hear is going to change. Not only the raw SPL and the physical feeling changing as you're turning it up and down, which does happen, but the proportion of it compared to the rest of your mix changes because of that Fletcher-Munson curve. So that is something to consider. This doesn't mean only ever listen at one spot on your volume dial and only ever try to get uh, mixes or masters up to a certain level, but it means spend the majority of your time. I spend maybe 80% of my time or more making critical listening decisions at one specific level where I've been really comfortable and become attuned at listening. And then, of course, once I've made those critical decisions, I do listen to things more quietly. Maybe you have a dim switch on your uh, console where you can turn down the volume to a, another spot for a little bit, listen more quietly, make sure things work there, and then crank it up too and make sure it sounds fun when it's even louder. But I do recommend the majority of your critical listening decisions being done at a reasonable level that isn't going to wear you out and at a consistent level so you can really develop a sense memory for how things should sound and feel in your room. One last super quick note on this point by way of punching. If you want to find out what level you're listening at and you want to establish a good listening level, try an SPL meter. And you can get, in many cases, a free or very inexpensive SPL meter for your phone. Yeah. So if you don't have an SPL meter, get one of those for your phone, download one for your Android or your iPhone, find out what level you're currently listening at. And if you want a fancy professional SPL meter, of course, those exist too.
like I said, something around 80 dB-ish has been appropriate for me in the mastering environment. Some people who mix like to mix more quietly than that, so they could be lower than 80 dB. My guess is that once you're getting below 60 dB, it's probably far too quiet, but who am I to know? Who am I to judge? Try it out for yourself and see what works best for you. Okay, so what was that? 30, 40 minutes answering a handful of questions. I hope I gave you some pretty in-depth, detailed answers. And I hope some of this is stuff you can put into practice in your own audio or music career going forward from here. If you have enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe over at Sonic Scoop. Have you subscribed yet? If not, go to sonicscoop.com. You can just subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Just type in Sonic Scoop, type in Justin Coletti, whatever, you'll get it there. If you want to get our newsletter, go to sonicscoop.com, upper right-hand side. You will see newsletter sign up there. There's another cool thing you can get along with our newsletter if you sign up on sonicscoop.com, and that is you can get emails from our insiders list. And our insiders list is when we tell you about amazing deals coming from audio and sound companies that are only around for a limited time, and that will be steep, steep discounts. I mean, we've had Insider Blast go out because Plugin Alliance was doing 95% off some of their most popular plugins. We just recently did one with Eventide, where their H3000, this iconic plugin and effects unit, was 75% off. That one was just over the Memorial Day weekend. If you missed that, go to sonicscoop.com. Check out the newsletter there. Sign up for it. You don't want to miss both our regular weekly newsletter with all of our best stories, as well as those insider blasts. Big shout out and thanks again to our sponsors, Isotope. I am using their stuff literally every day, and they make really interesting forward-looking effects, as does Eventide. Eventide has been making very cool, very forward-looking effects for like 40 years, and they are still making them today, and they are still making envelope pushing wild interesting things today like fission which you've got to check out in the structural effects line if you want to affect your transient separately from your sustain my goodness that is something that this thing can do mangled verb black hole the h3000 great stuff also check out sound toys check them out at soundtoys.com making things like the echo boy the crystallizer some of the most fun and useful plugins out there. You can try out plugins from any of these companies for free at the respective websites, isotope.com, soundtoys.com, and eventideaudio.com. Last, certainly not least, big thanks to you, particularly if you want to become a supporter of this podcast. Has this podcast been useful to you? Have you learned things that can help you make more money in audio? Well, share a dollar of that money with us per month to say thank you for this podcast, or $4. Buy me a cup of coffee a month for making this podcast. And if you do, you can get tremendous perks like behind the scenes exclusive live Q&As with me and some of our biggest guests, huge discounts on some of our most popular courses, a huge shout out and thanks like I'm going to give to Jason Beard, who just became a supporter of this podcast on the podcast, and a whole bunch of other great stuff. You can get my book on mixing advice from your mastering engineer free at some of those supporter levels. So definitely check it out. Thanks for hanging out with me for this week's podcast. See you next time.